Everyone's talking about the urban company as the next big tech success story in India. But here's what no one's telling you. Beneath the glossy growth numbers and the tech disruptor tag, there are a few hidden risks that most investors are completely overlooking. And if you're thinking about buying this stock, you need to see this first. In the past few years, India's stock market has seen a wave of tech-enabled platform companies. Think Zomato, Nika, Policy Bazaar, and now the Urban Company joins the list. Many are loss-making, yet trade at sky-high valuations. Why? Because investors believe these are the next big thing. But as someone who has analyzed dozens of tech companies, both in the US and now in India, I can tell you valuations without understanding risk is a recipe for disaster. In this video, I'll walk you through the urban company's latest quarterly results, break down how their revenues and margins really look once you remove the gloss, and expose some hidden pressure points, from ballooning expenses to questionable diversification bets. We'll compare it to similar US peers like Angie and Fiverr, and finally arrive at what I believe is a more realistic valuation. So before you hit that buy button or get carried away by the IPO hype, stay with me till the end because the numbers tell a story that most headlines completely miss. Let's dive in. If you are excited about this video, please do hit the like button, subscribe for more, and do share this video with someone who has currently bought the urban company or is planning to buy it. Before we begin, please note, this is not any kind of financial advice. I am merely sharing my opinions and my understanding based on years of experience in the US markets. And now I'm trying to apply that in the Indian markets. So this is me simply sharing my perspective and my viewpoints with you. And in the process, maybe it will help you get some education and perspective from a global perspective. So let's talk about the urban company's business model. Now, the urban company, which was formerly known as Urban Clap, it operates a tech-enabled marketplace, connecting customers with verified service professionals for everything from plumbing to cleaning to, to beauty and appliance repair. What's key here is that the urban company doesn't employ these professionals directly. It works as an aggregator, taking commissions on each completed job. Payments, scheduling, quality control, all of this happens on the app. Now, if you talk about the revenue streams, then the first one is that they get commissions from professionals, you know, which is about 85% of the total revenue. Then there is lead generation and subscription fees. The third is product sales, you know, tools and consumables that these professionals need to use. And also they have this RO uh, business called Native. And I believe they are also coming up with uh, home security or home lock systems. And then they have the advertising and partnerships. And now the company has recently organized into four key segments. So one is the India consumer services business, and that excludes InstaHelp. I really don't understand why InstaHelp is not included in that, but you know, that's up to the management. So that's the India consumer services business. If you, if you need plumbing services, cleaning services, or if you need any kind of beauty services, you can just, you know, leverage the India consumer services business. The second is their product sales. Like I said earlier, the RO business sales uh, under the native brand, which is their in-house brand. Uh, the third is the international business. Again, it's very similar to the consumer business in India, but this operates in the UAE, in Singapore, and and also Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but there's some sort of a joint venture uh, with a local organization there. And the final one is the InstaHelp, which is like the daily housekeeping and cleaning service. Again, I think it should be a part of the India consumer services business, but management wants to keep it separate. I believe they feel like this segment can really grow. And this segment currently is in at least in quarter two has been a bit of a problem for that and we'll, we'll get to that once we get to the numbers now let's take a look at their recent september 2025 quarterly results revenues overall grew by about 37 percent to 380 crores now that sounds great right but here's the twist the breakdown tells us a very different story the india consumer services business grew about 24 percent year over year 
But if you look at sequentially, compared to the previous quarter, it fell 3%. The native revenues, it jumped about 180%. That's impressive. But still, losing about 10 crores. Now, they've been losing 10 crores pretty much every single quarter for, for native. And that suggests that they are possibly selling near the cost price of it. Considering that there's working capital tied up with warehousing these RO, and then you know there was a fire in one of their warehouses recently, and on top of that, there is an ongoing litigation with Kent RO. It's questionable whether this diversification makes sense at all. I mean, you are a platform business. Why go about selling RO? I don't understand that, but it is what it is. And again, here as well, if you look at the drag on the EBITDA margins, which we'll come to in a bit, you'll see why I'm not so big a fan of this particular business. The third segment is the international business. Now, it just grew about 7% in terms of revenues. But more importantly, it turned profitable. You know, it went from about 12.9 crores in loss last year to a small profit this quarter. And that's good, you know, considering that the revenue only jumped by about 7%. Turning profitable means that it is able to generate those good margins in the international business. And the fourth segment is InstaHelp. It's a very small segment as of now. It just generated 1.5 crores in revenues, which is up 500%, but still it's just 1.5 crores. But it posted a massive 43 crore loss. Now, of course, that is because it's a relatively new segment and they are trying to make some investments into it to scale it up. Eventually, they are hoping that this would be a profitable and high growth segment for them. So that's exactly what's happening. You know, it's clearly in an investing mode right now and they are trying to expand aggressively. But the expense growth, if you take a look, you know, we talked about revenues growing at 37%. If you look at the expense growth, that's at 56% year over year. And that's huge. So the operating margins crashed from like a negative 6% last year to negative 21%. That's a sharp deterioration. Now let's look at their balance sheet because this is where things get a little interesting. You can see that they have about 199 uh, crores in cash and cash equivalent. And then they have about 651 in bank balance. Add to that, uh, they have investments about 863 crores. That brings us to a total uh, liquid assets of about uh, 1713 crores, which is more than 50% of their total uh, balance sheet size, which is about 2800. And then they have no major debt, just about 322 crores of lease and other liabilities. So despite a poor profit and loss statement, the balance sheet looks really strong and it provides a safety cushion for now. But if you go to the cash flow statement, this is where you see the real store. You start with a loss before tax of uh, 53 crores, uh, just for share-based payment expense, which is 48 crores for this uh, period ended September 30th. That's about a 50% increase from last year. Management decided to reward themselves with 50% higher stock despite having heavy losses. You add ad additional adjustments. Uh, you come to operating profit or loss before working capital changes of uh, about 14 crores, loss of 14 crores here. And then you make uh, adjustments for working capital. And then you get to net cash used in operation uh, operating activities of negative 17.9 crores. You further deduct the cash used towards property, plant and equipment and other intangible assets of uh, 16 crores. And that gives you free cash flows of negative uh, uh, 31 crores. Now let's talk about how do we even value a company like this, right? Which is which is still bleeding cash. Let's take a look at if there's any listed peers in India and globally. Now, from an Indian perspective, there is no listed peer. So let's take a look at the global situation. Uh, there's a company in the US. It, it's listed on NASDAQ. It's called Angi Inc. or Angi Inc. I don't know however they pronounce it. A-N-G-I. That's the ticker. It's the US equivalent of the urban company. It has the similar home services model. Now, they have about a billion dollars in revenue. The thing is their revenue has stalled. They have been, you know, about the same kind of revenue over the past three, four years now. But it is a profitable company. They sell at a price to sales of 0.5 times and the PE of nine times. 
they have a free cash flow margin of about six to seven percent do bear in mind the urban company has guided that they would try and reach an EBITDA margin of about nine to ten percent in a steady state over a long period of time that's what their plan is as well which would mean that you know their free cash flow margin would kind of be around the similar similar scale that's around 10 percent but we'll come back to that later the second comparison we can do is with um, platform companies such as fiverr and upwork again these are companies listed on the u.s stock exchange fiverr has a ticker fvrr upwork is upwk these are online freelancing marketplaces they have a very similar business model they do not provide a hardware services it's more of a digital uh, kind of a service you know if, if if someone wants to create something uh, uh digitally you know designers think copywriters and, and and that kind of a business model so it's asset light and it's digital so free cash flow margins in case of both fiverr and upwork are in the mid 20s price to sales even if their free cash flows are so high price to sales is around two two and a half times still much lower than what the indian new age stocks command and then there's an australian company its ticker is art the company's name is airtasker it's a small australian company but has a very identical business model think of it as the australian version of the urban uh, urban company this company is growing in the mid teens so it it has not as high a growth as as the urban company but it's still good growth but more importantly, they have turned free cash flow positive uh, recently, and they are selling at a price to sales of about two and a half, three times. Now, of course, you could argue that the urban company deserves a small premium because it's growing faster. You tell me what kind of a price to sales should we apply to it? Let's say it's, it's a price to sales of five or six times. It, that's still generous, right? Considering all the other companies that we talked about from a global perspective traded about 0.5 to two and a half three times let's say the urban company is an amazing company it has amazing growth in front of it and let's give it a generous six times sales now that would imply a market cap close to six thousand crores compared to the current market cap which is north of twenty thousand crores that is a potential 70 percent overvaluation let's do a bit more in terms of the valuation math right let's let's try to do it a different way let's say okay let's not get into the price to sales ratios let uh, let's do a bit of a, a dcf or project forward so let's do that let's assume that the urban company grows at 30 percent annual revenue growth for the next three years so we're talking about fi 2028 in that case, considering current revenue, if they grow at about 30% annual growth rate for the next three years, their revenues could be close to 2,500 crores by FI 2028. And the management has been saying that they want their steady state EBITDA margin to be close to uh, uh, nine or 10 percent let's say they are able to to achieve that in the next three years the management hasn't provided any specific guidance in terms of when they would be able to do that but let's just assume right that free cash flow margins or EBITDA margins improve up to 10 percent that would be 250 crores of free cash flows by 2028 now give it a generous multiple you know let's say 30 times free cash flows that would still bring us to a valuation close to 7500 crores in FY28 now you might say but you know for a company that's growing in in like 20 or 30 percent maybe that's too low let's give it an optimistic 50 times multiple even if you do that and even after all the assumptions that they will get to 10 percent free cash flow margins by 2028 applying a 50 times gives you the market cap of 12,500 crores in fy28 that is still a 40 percent downside from current levels so let's recap it urban company it has a strong balance sheet it has a scalable marketplace model they do have a good TAM total addressable market it's huge but their unique economics are weak their costs are ballooning and I'm not so sure if I'm happy with their diversification moves you know all the hardware business included in there right now for me it's a wait and watch stock and of course traders can play the short-term swings but 
for a long-term investor, let's wait for the operating leverage to kick in. Let's wait for the cash flows to turn positive. And let's wait for the stock-based dilution to stabilize. I mean, 50% increase in stock-based compensation when your company is going negative to me that doesn't make any sense at all sense at all i know the management is may, maybe ex boston consulting and iits and iims but what's the point at the end of the day the business needs to talk for itself so until then i wouldn't touch it not until the price to sales compresses down to mid single digits and then growth turns profitable so what do you think do you feel that the urban company is overvalued is it undervalued is it fairly valued let me know in the comment section below and i will read each and every single comment also do let me know which other company you would want me to analyze going forward if you haven't checked my video on the real truth about nifty's pe ratio and why the average of 18 times is very misleading check that out next It'll completely change how you think index valuations in India work. I'll put a link in the description and over here. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.